Hey everyone, this is Three Questions with Matt Joseph. Music man. Got the music. Got like it. Share dancing. All right, we're with uh <laughs> is it is it Dr. Matthew Joseph? Yeah. It is, it is, but Matt is fine. All right. Okay. So Matt, hey, thanks for thanks for being on the podcast. And uh, we were just kind of no, talking and uh, uh, we you, we were telling me before we started, um, you have a book called The Power Connections, and we're going to talk more about that uh, in our awesome. other podcast. You work with a uh, fellow Canadian, Brian Aspinall, who Absolutely. is just hanging out at the beach or doing something <laughs> right now. So like, yeah, someone give, he, he says he's made a million dollars over the pandemic, yet he doesn't have a shirt. He doesn't have a shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's awesome that that is awesome okay so so uh matt we're gonna do uh three questions and so uh having a great conversation with you and one of the things that i really appreciate that you share with me before we even got the podcast um is really kind of those connections that you make with educators around the world uh and i and i see a lot of your stuff on social media so when you actually yeah. think about your career and you think about you know educators that really inspired you like when you think of a teacher who inspired you? Like who is a teacher like in your, maybe as a student, maybe as a colleague that inspired you and why? Uh, sure. Well, when, when I was in um, Springfield College where I was an undergrad and at the time I was kind of, you know, sowing our oats, right? We kind of go to college, we kind of figure out what we're going to do. And one of the things that my, my teacher, um, Suzanne Campbell, uh, she, she recognized quickly is I like to talk. I like to talk in class. I like to do projects, I, and anytime we had to write a paper, I'd, I'd always have a great excuse why I could do a project, or I could speak, mm -hmm. or I could find a way to get around writing, because it was definitely my weak spot. So instead of just owning that, I found a way around it. And even though I thought I was incredibly sneaky at 18 to this doctor college professor I didn't think could figure me out, so she finally pulled me aside and she said, hey, listen. Um, I know you don't want to write, but I need you to write. This was a college level English class. Mm -hmm. She says, what if you keep a journal for the entire freshman year and I'll let you out of any of the formal writing process. So I'm like, uh, hell yeah, I'll write a journal. Like, well, this would be easy. And it, it turned out, and I still have it. And it, it, it turned out that I documented every day of my freshman year, but what it allowed me to do is express myself. I, and some of the things I wouldn't, you know, I'm shocked she'd even read, but she'd make right. comments about Friday nights out and, and <laughs> different things. But she would allow me to just write and she would always meet with me after and be like sharing some things like, OK, why don't you turn this into an actual story? Why don't you? And she saw how I learned. And because I wasn't a real formal writer as a younger student, she didn't hold that against me. I mean, she literally let me write a journal for the entire year instead of five major papers. And it really showed me once I became a teacher, because I went for elementary education, I looked back and at the time I was like, oh, this is cool. I get to write a journal joke with my friends. I'm like, ah, I got out of this assignment. <laughs> but what it, <laughs> what it allowed me to do is actually be more articulate, be, bring more ideas into it, share some of the things that I wanted to share from my lens. Um, I'm sure it entertained her weekly to read what I had to write in there. But it was something that showed me early on that if the teacher can reach a student at their capacity and things mm -hmm. that they do well, I was, I was psyched to write each week one. Cause I'm like, how can I shock her this week? But it just mm. turned into a collaborative opportunity for me to grow as a writer and for me to start to just her, her goal was just to get me to write every day. Right. And, and then that's what happened. And that was something I'll never forget. And Susan Campbell, is this Susan Campbell? Is that yeah. correct? Susan Campbell, if you are listening. Oh, uh, what's up? There you go. So, Hey, there's actually like interesting listening to you because I, I think, um, one of the things that I really focus on is really trying to tap into the passions and the strengths of kids. And I think yeah. that is something that is really important. And, but there's also this adverse, right? There's this opposite side of like, and I, I've talked with Dean Chereski a lot about this kind of exposing, you know, our students to things that they might not necessarily want to do that they might not see as strengths. And I think there's that balance that we have to kind of find because yeah, it's great to develop strengths. It's great to develop, you know, the things that we're really good at, I think a great teacher also pushes you in some areas that you struggle with. And now, you know, you think about that capacity is that, Hey, you didn't want to write now you're you've written one book onto your second own a publishing company, which is pretty right. incredible to kind of think about that. And so it is, is it is, you know, we do want to tap in the strengths. We do want to find those passions, but I think when you build those relationships as you know, as your teachers did with you, 
I think then we can kind of also develop some areas that we are surprised at. And I think, you know, great leaders do that really well too. And, you know, kind of, you know, segueing, segueing to the next question. Uh, I know that you were a principal. I know that you formerly yep. worked in central office. And so with your leadership journey, who's like an administrator that stood out to you and why? So she is currently the superintendent of NADIC where I was a principal and she went to Boston College two years before I didn't. And, and when I joined, she kind of was there to guide me through Anna Nolan. And she was somebody who I looked at as just, she was a principal at the time when I was a principal in NADIC. And she was just really intelligent, really smart. And she was an administrator at a different level than I was. She was in middle school and looking to go into central office. And I was an elementary principal. And she was incredibly blunt. Like if there was something I didn't do well, she let me know. So one of the things that I started to, when I went through the, the dissertation process at Boston College and went through the superintendent's course, she said, well, the one thing you don't have, I mean, she, this is how she was saying, right. one thing you don't have, you've never worked in a middle or a high school. Start coming with me and do walkthroughs at different mm -hmm. levels. So she would let me do, you know, walkthroughs in, in middle school. And then when she was the assistant superintendent at the high school, so she was very, uh, giving in her time and to, to training others. And that was something that I always took with me that she was willing to do that uh, for me as a newer administrator. And what it allowed me to do is build up that gap where I wasn't similar to what you said, you have to build up our strengths. I had some really mm -hmm. good strengths being an elementary principal for a long time, but where I didn't have the, the leadership capacity was in the high school mm -hmm. was in, um, some of the upper middle schools. So she took me with her mm -hmm. and said, what did you see? What did you see? Tell me how this worked out. What would you give advice to that teacher? It doesn't matter. You never taught high school. You can tell them right. how to become a better educator. And she was really somebody who um, helped me along um, in that, in, in that state. And that essentially led me to going into central office um, after my time in Natick. Yeah. And like, actually, I, I'm pretty sure that I've connected with Anna Nolan and I know some people mm -hmm. in Natick. So first of all, shout out Anna Nolan. <laughs> So, so uh, you, I don't know if you knew about the air horn. The air horn's no. The air horn is a bonus. Air horn is a bonus. <laughs> I, the, the the thing that I love what you're you're sharing there too, and I think this is really you know something I really try to do is you know spending that time uh, really investing in people and really that that actually you know Anna as you're talking about Anna doing that, um, you, you see that as a totally selfless thing. But I think there's, I know this sounds weird. There's a little bit of selfishness in there too, because like we all want school to do better. And so I invest that time right. into people. Uh, those people go out, they go do incredible things. School system's better. Uh, we do this, but you know, we, we kind of like, I've always talked about this notion of competitive collaboration. Uh, the idea is that, you know, like if, if you're a principal and I'm a principal in the same district, I don't want your school blowing me out of the water, right? Like I don't right. want your school being so much better than mine. And everyone say like, I want to go to math school, right? Um, so like there is that there, there's a certain, certain level of, I guess, c competition in that sense that like, Hey, I got to pick it up. Yeah. I want to do this too. So the reason I talk about the notion of competitive collaboration is that I know that in that environment is that I could, you know, go across the district and say, Matt, you're doing some really incredible stuff. Can you kind of help me get to that point? Right. So like you're, you're, it's like kind of both that push and pull. And I think a lot of times we talk always about collaboration. Like we're always working with one another, but there should be some push. I think that is an element of it too. Like I, I have this, this notion that I want, you know, the work that I do to be really, really great, but it doesn't mean other people can't do great work as well, but it's, it actually helps me focus on like, Hey, what are they doing? That's really good. Like we were talking about that, um, that lounge activity. And you said that I'm like, Oh, that's a beautiful idea. You know, how do I actually learn from that? I know that you'd help me kind of go through that and maybe kind of make it on my own too. And we'll talk more about that in the other podcast. Yeah. But, but, I, but it just helps you raise your game when totally. you push yourself and, and, yeah. and you get driven by seeing you know, other people who are driven in, in this culture of mediocrity is gone. And for me, I want to surround myself with people who are going to push me because yeah. if not, I know my personality, I'll sit back and be like, yeah, this is great. And somebody will come in and be like, you're great. We don't need yes people in, right. in our profession. Totally. We need someone to push you. Yeah. And that, and that, bo I think, you know, as you're talking about Anna, it's that both that push and support. So shout out to Anna. So last question. And you talked about some of the things that you you've grown with, uh, which mm -hmm. I really appreciate your vulnerability for kind of sharing some of your own, because I think a lot of times people are like, Hey, this is what I'm great. I'm good at this, but don't necessarily right. share when they, you know, where they struggled. Right. And now, 
people see that you've accomplished a lot in your work, you know, accomplished both, you know, in education, uh, you know, outside in your consulting, your, your writing career, but people just think you got there. Right. So when you look back at your, when you look back at your career and you look back at your first year of teaching, if you were to go back and talk to yourself, what advice would you give to your first year teacher self? Um, I would give it to, to, to the, to the young Matt Joseph and all the first year teachers now. And it's the first line in, in my most recent book. It's be unapologetically you. In my first year of being a teacher, I wanted to play a teacher. Mm -hmm. I had a briefcase. I walked in Matt Joseph with a tie. I, I, everything I saw on TV for being a teacher, that's mm -hmm. what I did. I walked in, I had the things on the board. I had all the teacher store stuff up and it didn't mean anything until I showed who I was as a teacher. And I think this goes for first year teachers and first year principals too, because for some reason I didn't learn from that. And when I was a first year principal, I did the same thing. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, Mr. Joseph walking with a briefcase. I'm a backpack hat wearing guy. And I think when I started to have fun in classrooms and do like a back, you know, God, I was in the classroom in 1995 when we would do the, the, the big Jeopardy game on the computer. It was like the coolest thing. You can make your own questions. Jeopardy right? PowerPoint. There you go. Like Just that. say Jeopardy PowerPoint. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Bringing back old school right there, right? Yeah. And once I started to do some of that and let the kids have a voice and we did projects. And again, this sounds like, oh, yeah, we know this. Yeah, but this is back in 1995 when you just were supposed to let the kids sit there and do worksheets. Right. And once I was able to do that both in the classroom and then as a first year principal, people started to buy into, okay, this guy's a good guy. He's here for us. It's not the boss or it's not the teacher. It's someone who's here to celebrate what we're doing. And I think that would be the advice I'd give all first year teachers and, and first year principals. Celebrate who you are mm -hmm. and be that the best version of yourself. Because in that, you have to know some of the things that you don't do well. And I share the writing story. And, and another thing, when I was at Boston College, I was um, writing my dissertation. I was 42 years old. And I'm like, I'm still not a great writer walk my dissertation into the BC Writing Center, this 19 year old like honor student who's just working for minimum wage in the writing center is mm -hmm. like, can I help you, sir? Do you go here? I'm like, yeah, can you read my dissertation? Like, I know I needed that help. I was a school leader at that point, but asking questions as a first year teacher is show strength, not weakness. So it's actually, it's interesting to listen to that advice. And I think, I think it's, it's important to, to appreciate that both as like, an educator, but for our students, right? When you have that notion of like being unapologetically you, do we actually, cons you know, do that with our students as well? And it's, it's interesting because I would actually say I, I was the opposite. Um, I, I did wear a tie every day and, and, and I actually, cause that's kind of who I am. That's kind of what I do. Right. right. And it's just, cool. and I remember actually, um, people ripping me on that and they're like, well, you can't, you know, like get to the level of the kids. I'm like, you know, kids actually have no issue with me when I'm like on the ground playing right. to, in my tie. Comfortable. Yeah. Like right. I, I just like wearing a tie to work every day. I remember actually getting that too. And I think that notion of being unapologetically you, this is something I was thinking about as you're talking. One of the things I hear and I've heard this forever is like, Oh, we need to get kids to share their voice. And I would say, yeah, we do. But what happens when their voice doesn't agree with you? What, what happens when their voice has yeah. different viewpoints in you, right? Do we encourage that? Or do we just say, let's have student voice. But as long as they say the things that we expect them to right. say. Controlled student voice. Yeah, like, and it's like the reality is that, that, that idea of, I think that is a really important concept, the notion of being unapologetically you, as long as, as part of that, is also helping students find that their own voice, their own pathway, finding that not just like saying, let's, Hey, let's, let's share our voice. Unless you'd say right. stuff I don't like, then shut right. up. Right. right. And but, I think that goes to a deeper, you know, conversation around school culture and, and totally. vulnerable and, and learning versus school, like and, and, and having that those learning opportunities yeah. versus lessons. Well, I love that. And I'm, I, I really appreciate your vulnerability. Appreciate you sharing the shout outs that you gave. And I'm really looking forward to the, to the next podcast. So, so Matt, thanks so much for, for being on here. Uh, I appreciate you. Thanks. And everyone, thanks for taking the time uh, to listen to another episode of <laughs> three questions. I did delay because I couldn't find the sound. Thanks, yeah. Just kind of like slowing everything down. Anyways, thanks for so listening, fun. everybody.